You have spent months formulating your research question, gathering literature, and designing your project. Now comes the part that ties it all together, your methodology section. This is where you show the reader how you plan to answer your research question. And in this video, I am going to give you all the steps that you need to come up with the perfect research methodology for your research proposal. My name is Lerato Kanomsa of All Things Academia, where we explore and explain all things in the academic world. Now, this is part seven of our research proposal component series. If you have missed the previous videos, I will link them in the description down below for easy access. Just click on those links and go to the one that speaks about the section that you are currently busy with. This one here focuses on your methodology section whether you are collecting interviews survey or observational data your methodology section is the blueprint for your research so how do you structure it let's break it down step by step first thing you're going to start with the research paradigm your research paradigm is your worldview or your lens in which you approach your research it informs your methods and helps you justify why you chose them so what is a research paradigm it is the foundational framework that guides how you gather interpret and analyze your data it involves philosophical assumptions about reality knowledge and methods and that's all that you need to know about paradigms for now there are four to five research paradigms that are popular that people use in academia for research and in this video i'm going to cover two because we cannot cover all of them and besides this video is not specifically about research paradigms but it includes other components of a research proposal as well and this one focuses on methodology i will however do another video that focuses on paradigms and a research methodology series that goes in depth but for now we're gonna briefly discuss the this, giving you all the things that you need to know specifically for your research proposal so back to research paradigms if our focus of the study is on perception and we're focusing on the perceptions of the first year students on online academic coaching then we can choose the constructivist paradigm this means that we go into this research believing that reality is socially constructed and is subjective. We believe that people's experiences shape their understanding of the world. So this aligns perfectly with qualitative methods as we are interested in exploring the perceptions of first year students of online academic coaching. So understanding why we're using this paradigm is basically because this study is situated within a constructivist paradigm which views the effectiveness of online academic coaching as subjective and shaped by individual experiences this perspective allows for an in-depth understanding of how students perceive and make sense of their academic coaching experiences if our study however was focusing on the effectiveness of online academic coaching for academic success then we would have used the post positivist paradigm this means we will go into the study believing that reality exists objectively that our understanding of reality is imperfect and it is influenced by the context this kind of paradigm normally uses quantitative and observational methods to measure and test hypotheses and evaluate interventions. It acknowledges that the findings are normally probabilities rather than absolutes. So if we're focusing on effectiveness, then we'll be focusing on measuring the outcomes like academic performances or improvements. And the post-positivist approach would have been appropriate here because we'll be using quantitative data to measure these outcomes. So after you have defined your research paradigm, it is now time to outline your research design. This section basically outlines how you will gather and analyze your research data to answer your research question. So just like I've said, your paradigm would actually determine your research design and your research design will determine the next section. And that section will determine the next section of your methodology. So this is the nature of the methodology section or the methodology chapter if you're writing a thesis. One thing is intertwined with every Everything else they all tie together so your paradigm determines your design your design determines your data collection your data collection determines sampling and so forth so this is what you need to keep in mind that whatever you decide on the section before it actually has an impact 
on the next section so now that we know that our paradigm that we've chosen if we're focusing on perception has to do with constructivism meaning that it is within the qualitative frame then we know that our research design is going to be qualitative if we're focusing however on effectiveness and our paradigm was post positivism then we know that our research design would have been quantitative your research design is basically a plan of how your study will unfold. It determines whether you will use a qualitative or a quantitative or a mixed method. So since we are choosing a study that focuses on perception, then the research design that we're going to use is qualitative, which focuses on personal experiences and allowing us to go into depth and into the insights of personal experiences, allowing us to explore personal perceptions and motivations. Now that you know your design, it is time to define who exactly will be part of your study. This part explains your population and how you select that sample. Your population is the larger group that you are interested in studying. For example, first year university student and your sampling is the subset of that population or that larger group which is the number of the first year students that you are actually going to interact with within sampling itself you have the sampling strategy and the sampling science the sampling strategy is you outlining how you're going to find that subset group you are looking for and the sampling size tell us how many people are the subset group that you are interacting with so for example in our study we're going to use purposive sampling to find the subset that we are looking for and the sampling size will be 10 to 15 university students that we're actually going to talk to during this data collection so with the purposeful sampling strategy is selecting people purposefully you're looking for specific people within that criteria so you need to have a criteria of your selection so we're selecting people that one we know that they have been involved or they are part of some online academic coaching they have to be first year students and maybe we can say that they need to be currently involved in an online coaching program and perhaps you can add other factors or elements to this criteria to refine it further with the sampling size we do not want to say we're going to speak to 50 people because that might be overwhelming true that it might not be overwhelming while you are doing the interviews but it might be very strenuous and stressful when you are doing the analysis so when you are thinking of the sampling size you're not thinking of the practicality of actually doing the collection but the practicality of doing the analysis later on so when you write this part you need to be both descriptive but also justify this is again the nature of the methodology whatever you do you justify with your research design your paradigm every aspect of your methodology you need to justify you don't just say i am going to do this you say why so in this case we can phrase our sampling this way the study will use purposive sampling to select 10 to 15 first year university students who are participating in online academic coaching program this sampling size allows for a detailed nuanced understanding without sacrificing depth in analysis now that you have defined your research paradigm and you've outlined your research design and you have identified who you are collecting data from it is time to move to the next step and say what techniques you are going to use to collect that data this section is called the data collection methods which refers to the tools and techniques that you're going to use to gather the information that you need this could be interviews, surveys, focus groups, or observations. For the example that we are using to gather information around perceptions from the students, we're going to use interviews. But saying interviews is not enough because we need to say are we using formal interviews or not formal interviews, structured or semi-structured. And in our case, we're going to use semi-structured interviews. And we also need to say why. And we're going to say because it allows for flexibilities within the conversation while gathering the data that we need. So for example, we do not lead with the questions, but we lead with a conversation and throw in questions there and there that will give us the kind of information that we need rather than having a structured interview where someone just sits and you ask them a series of questions and they just answer those questions but we want those interviews to be conversational to be more open and easygoing and the tool for this is that we're going to design interview questions that are open-ended that will guide the conversation 
and help the participant to speak freely and give them ideas on what kind of things that they need to share. So in procedure, we will write this section like this. In-depth semi-structured interviews will be conducted with each participant. The interview guide will include open-ended questions about students' experiences with online coaching, perceived benefits and challenges, and reflections on how it has influenced their academic performance. So once data is collected, you will need to analyze that data. And this section details how exactly are you going to analyze the data that you've collected from your participants. So then the data analysis part of your methodology tell us the process you are going to use to organize, interpret, and draw conclusions from the data that you have gathered from your participants. So again, here I want to say there are different ways to analyze data like triangulation, the metric, and the lot. And it depends also whether you are doing a quantitative or a qualitative because quantitative studies actually have their way of analyzing the stats and the data that they've collected. Again, I will do a separate video or series about data analysis, but for the purpose of this research, just so you have an idea on what exactly goes under this section, we are going to use a thematic analysis because our topic kind of like calls for it. So a thematic analysis identifies key themes and patterns across the participants' responses. With the data that we have collected, we can use the procedures of coding the data according to these key themes, such as perceived effectiveness, challenges, and suggestions for improvement. We could phrase this part like this. The data collected will be analyzed using thematic analysis, allowing for the identification of key themes and patterns in the student's responses. Responses will be coded and categorized based on the recurring themes such as perceived effectiveness challenges and suggestions of improvement. You're done with telling us how you're going to do this research. But there are some risk management that you need to do when you're doing a research. This goes under your ethical consideration aspect of your methodology. Ethical considerations have to do with consent, maintaining confidentiality, and ensuring that participants' rights are respected at all times. So there's different things that you need to consider. For example, if you're going to organizations, if you're going to groups or you're going to spaces and businesses of people, you need a gatekeeper's letter. If you're going to talk to people, you need consent forms and you need to explain to those people what the study is about and what is the purpose of the study so that they decide whether they want to participate or not. You need to give them right to withdraw at any time they feel uncomfortable with the study and if they wish not to continue, whether they have started the process, they can pull at any time they feel like it. And also you need to think about how you're going to protect the identity. Even if you feel like the study does not stigmatize anyone, but it is good to protect the people that are participating in the studies all the time. So for the specific topic and the kind of study we are doing, we will need to consider also a few things. So we're going to phrase this section this way. Participants will be provided with an informed consent form that explain the study's purpose, their rights, and how their data will be used to ensure confidentiality pseudonyms will be assigned and identifying information will be removed from the transcripts. All data will be stored securely and only the researcher will have access to it. In some cases, I think you need to state that the data will be destroyed after how many years and in what way will it be destroyed. Most of the times we say it will be shredded after five years or ten years from the publication of the research. After we've said how we're going to do the study, who we're going to talk to, how we're going to talk to them, what modes are we using, and how are we protecting these participants? We are almost done, but not yet. The last part of the methodology is actually limitations. Every study has its own limitations. To acknowledge this in advance shows transparency and critical thinking. When you think about limitations, you want to think around the challenges and the constraints that you might face in doing this study and how will that affect the results of the study. For example, with the study that we are doing, the limitation might be the sampling size that we have chosen. We're talking to 10 to 15 people. The sampling size might be too small to generalize the findings to all university students. But how we can mitigate that is by stating that actually qualitative data focuses on depth rather than breadth. So whenever you point out a limitation, you need to have a mitigation for that because you can't just tell us that this is a risk factor of my study or this is a limitation, but you do not tell us a way how you're going to get around that limitation. So it is good that you acknowledge that there are limitations, that you say that you are aware 
aware of them but also now state how you're going to manage those limitations so that you ensure that your study has rigor and validity at the end so to phrase what we've just talked about for the section of the study of course this is just one limitation as an example normally you'll have two or three or even more also same with the mitigations so this is how we're going to phrase this limitation and mitigation for the purpose of the study due to small sampling size and qualitative nature of the study findings may not be generalizable to all first year students in south africa however the depth of the data collected from each participant provides valuable insights that can inform future research and educational practices and lovelies this is how you structure the methodology section of your proposal by laying out your research paradigm design data collection and data analysis you not only show how you're going to get the data for your research but you also show why are these chosen methods fitting for your research having the methodology is good because you have shown how you're going to do this research what you need to do now is show us the timeline in which you're going to do this research so click the video that is appearing on your screen right now because that is the video that is going to show you how to create a timeline for your research what are you waiting for click on that video as i project to you love and grace in a way of second corinthians 13 verse 14.